welcome to the Of Course the Slab is Still Wet, Here Are Your Options webinar. My name is Larissa and I'll be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later we'll conduct a question and answer session. Please note this conference is being recorded. I'd like to turn the call over to Scott Tarr. Sir, you may begin. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Um, I'm going to give a seminar today called Of Course the Slab is Still Wet, Here Are Your Options. Uh, the main focus of the, the talk today really is on how concrete moisture can affect floor coverings and floor covering systems. Uh, but I will sprinkle in a couple of other issues that we're probably well familiar with that are also uh, moisture related as we go down through. Um, just a little background on myself. I worked 17 years at CCL Group, uh, a division of the Portland Cement Association, and five years with concrete engineering specialists with Bruce Supernon and Calvin McCall before opening up uh, my own consulting firm. So we do uh, consulting on concrete, and my particular area of expertise is floors and flooring on, on concrete floors. Today we're going to talk about the factors in the drying time of concrete slabs. I'll go over some of the latest test methods. Hopefully we're all kind of familiar with the background of, of most of the test uh, methods out there, but I, I wanted to just talk about some of the latest um, points on the test methods themselves <clears throat> and options to discuss at the pre-bid and pre-construction meeting, again, as they relate to concrete slab moisture, and then remediation options to discuss if the drying time exceeds expectations. What we're finding is that this is such a big issue that uh, everybody, by the time they find out that the drying time is going way beyond what they expected, they're looking for people to help out with the issue. and. You know, the concrete contractor is uh, usually getting called now uh, to help out with why this lab isn't drying as fast as, as they expected. And uh, most of the time, that, uh, that issue is way beyond the control of the concrete contractor. So I wanted to just kind of talk about uh, just the basis of that. Of course, what we're trying to avoid, again, this is floor covering failures. We've all seen probably the VCT, uh, problems with the adhesive, carpet tiles, uh, rolled carpet as well. You can see the mold issues that we're looking to avoid. Epoxies, not all epoxies are made and formulated to uh, be a remediation option. There are epoxies that are remediation options, but here's an epoxy that's bubbled. Uh, poor polyurethane gymnasium floors affected by moisture. Okay, here's a, um, uh, actually this is a sheet vinyl. You can see bubbles here. And I'll talk more about that. Um, this is actually a, uh, a coating system, and you can actually see the uh, joints in the previous VCT tile that was removed, in a, and, and it was actually the AT. It was a asbestos tile that was abated. All right, and again, here's uh, some blistering and some, uh, uh, this is actually a terrazzo. Okay, we've all seen these moisture issues before. What are the factors in the drying time? And I'm going to talk about each one of these, but basically the vapor retarder, uh, what type that vapor retarder sheet is, and its location, big factor in, in the drying time of concrete slabs, slab thickness, concrete mix design, surface finish, curing, and ambient condition. And ambient conditions can't be stressed enough. That's really something that is well beyond the control of the concrete contractor once the slab is in. All right, let's take a look at vapor retarder type and location. For generations, we've done, we've done a six mil poly, um, and we've found out that really those uh, sheets are not puncture resistant, uh, and they don't provide the permeance that is necessary to uh, pr prevent the constant transmission of moisture from the slab below. These days, there are new products on the market that are very low permeant, and puncture resistant, resistant to aging, um, if you core through an old concrete slab and it has your old 6 mil poly, oftentimes you can see the 6 mil poly has aged and you can actually crumble it in your hand. It's no longer effective. Uh, you've got a lap and tape all seams and boots and seal all penetration. Okay, here is a good example of that old 6 mil poly. I put it up here because it's doing two things that I want to show. First of all, you can see that it's actually this particular one is appears to be doing its job. You can see the condensation of moisture. What happens is moisture vapor migrates up through the ground and hits the underside of the vapor retarder, condenses into a liquid. And you can see the droplets of water on this particular vapor retarder since it's clear. 
The other thing I want to point out that I'll talk about is a blotter layer that's between the vapor retarder and the concrete slab that goes to location, and I will get to that. <clears throat> the newer materials that are out there are not polyethylene. They're polyolefin vapor retarders, and these are extremely puncture-resistant, tear-resistant, very low permeance, um, well beyond um, you know, the, the permeance of any floor covering. That's really the issue. You need your vapor retarder to retard the vapor transmission of moisture to a level below your actual floor covering system. If it allows moisture through more rapidly than your floor covering system, then your floor covering actually becomes a vapor retarder, and that's where we start to have issues. So these new polyolefin vapor retarders are very, very low permeance. What is vapor movement? Okay, regardless of where the water table is, it can be 10 feet down, 100 feet, or 1,000 feet down. At some point, you reach liquid water, liquid moisture. Above that liquid water table, you have a vapor. And that vapor has a vapor pressure, depending on what the temperature and, and relative humidity of that vapor is. And that vapor pressure is trying to equalize to the vapor pressure above the ground, above the slab. And most of the time, that vapor pressure above the slab is lower. So just naturally, the vapor migrates from areas of higher vapor pressure below the slab to areas of lower vapor pressure above the slab. It's a very slow migration process. It doesn't happen quickly, but it's that constant migration of moisture. And as vapor goes through a concrete slab, it changes phases to a liquid, back to a vapor, back to a liquid, and on goes uh, through the slab. What that process does is it transports soluble salts. Not unlike this building here, we know this as, as efflorescence. It's basically water that has rained on the side of this brick building. The water has penetrated the mortar and the brick, and as the water comes back out of that mortar and brick, it transports those soluble salts. Once the water evaporates, it leaves behind those salts, mostly potassium and sodium, but some calcium in there as well. Same thing happens on concrete slabs. Here's a great example of efflorescence below a VCP vapor floor cover. The VCP was removed, and you can actually see where the salts are left behind after the moisture has been uh, evaporated. And of course, then if you put a floor covering on top of that, a lot of times you'll see problems with the floor covering. All right, here's another example of vapor transmission. There's no vapor retarder below this slab. This is a warehouse slab or distribution facility slab, but in this case, they don't have a floor covering, but they store their product, vapor-sensitive product, cardboard boxes, directly on the slab. And that vapor moves up through that slab, condenses underneath the cardboard, and causes problems in that way. <clears throat> also in these warehouse slabs, the salts that are being transported to the surface are then getting tracked around the facility on these lift truck vehicles. And those salts, like any salt, actually is hygroscopic, so it's absorbing moisture out of the air and actually causing things like slab sledding events and things like that. So you can see, you know, here's an example of, of those salts that are actually coming from the concrete slab being transported by the moisture movement. Big thing is that moisture movement. I'm going to talk about that several times. Moisture movement, either from below the slab or moisture within the concrete moving up through the slab itself. So the purpose of a vapor retarder, then, is to stop that vapor movement from below the slab, at least cut off the new moisture source that's below the slab. You still have to deal with plenty of moisture within the concrete itself, but at least you're not dealing with moisture from below the slab. <clears throat> Here's an example of a project that I was just out last year. Uh, this is a, a very good vapor retarder, uh, polyolefin. Very puncture resistant, very tear resistant. However, it was placed below what they call a cushion layer or a blotter layer. Uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, ACI, the American Concrete Institute, uh, Committee 302 on the construction of concrete slabs, suggested a cushion layer or a blotter layer uh, because two, two real purposes, to protect the vapor retarder from being punctured and also so that you can place a concrete slab without having the finishing problems that placing concrete directly on plastic can generate, such as bleed problems, prolonged bleeding, delayed bleeding, things like that that plague finishers themselves. <clears throat> so they recommended putting a cushion layer or a blotter layer over the vapor retarder. And over 
a 20-year period, we saw a number of buildings with this detail have full covering problems, simply because that water layer doesn't go in bone dry. That water layer goes in with some moisture content, plenty of relative humidity, plenty of vapor within that, that water layer. Effectively, it will never allow the concrete slab to dry, ever, for any period of time. It has plenty of moisture in it to rehydrate the concrete slab. So we do not recommend, uh, if you're putting a moisture-sensitive floor covering or storing moisture-sensitive goods directly on the floor, we do not recommend this detail. Still see it a lot. Uh, there is this flow chart that is in ACI 302, and this particular one is in ACI 360, which is the design of concrete slabs. It's a newer document put out in 2010. Uh, the next version of 302 will have a similar, if not identical, flow chart. Uh, and what it basically says is it just has three different options. Uh, first thing it asks is, do you have a moisture-sensitive floor covering or moisture-sensitive product that you're going to put on the floor? If the answer is no, you don't need a vapor retarder, at least not for moisture. You may need it according to code, uh, radon gases, and things like that. But as far as moisture is concerned, you don't need it. The next thing, and this is where I wanted to point it out to us concrete contractors, designers don't read this flow chart correctly all the time. If you do have a vapor-sensitive product, it's going to go on the slab, it gives you two choices. Will it be a floor covering? And then over to the right, you'll see slabs in humidity-controlled areas. The purpose of this particular category was Distribution facilities, like warehouse slabs, in areas that are strictly humidity controlled because they contain products that are very moisture sensitive, such as rice. So if that's the purpose of that humidity controlled area, you can see that you have two different locations of the vapor retarder. There's a vapor sensitive, moisture sensitive floor covering or a product on the slab. It tells you to put the vapor retarder immediately below the slab. However, if you're in a humidity-controlled area, it gives the option of putting in that cushion layer or blotter layer. A lot of designers are now reading that as, hey, my office building has HVAC. That's a humidity-controlled system. I can then put that blotter layer according to the standard. And that is misreading this. If there's a vapor-sensitive floor covering or product that's going to go directly on the floor, the vapor retarder must be immediately beneath the concrete slab. All right, the other one is the option for rice storage facilities or other types of facilities, not for office building. I've seen that probably six to ten times in the past two years uh, where, where the designer has honestly misread this flow chart. Just wanted to point that out and make sure as concrete contractors we see that water layer and we question it. I think it's very important. Again, if you have that water layer in there, your slab will never dry out. Effectively, never. All right, slab thickness. Really, what I want to say here is the thicker the slab, the longer it's going to take for the drying time. A very crude rule of thumb might be a month per inch of slab thickness. Very, very crude. Certainly, it depends on the permeability of the concrete, the type of concrete mixture you have. But you can see that the thicker your slab is, the more moisture you have, and the longer it takes to get rid of that moisture. What are we talking about for getting rid of the moisture? Let's just take a look at a slice of the concrete slab. So we're looking at the profile of the concrete slab, and I'd like to measure slab depth versus relative humidity on the left-hand side. On day one, or day zero, when you first place that concrete, the relative humidity is about 100% top to bottom. It's wet concrete, you just placed it, there is no moisture gradient at all. Well, as the slab dries from top to bottom, you actually develop a moisture gradient. That moisture gradient is not linear. You can see that it's a curve, but you can see that the relative humidity at the top of the slab is something lower than the relative humidity at the bottom of the slab. And I would like to point out the bottom of the slab relative humidity is very dependent on the uh, inclusion or not of a vapor retarder. We have done moisture gradient profiles very simply, just drill and install moisture uh, relative humidity sensors at different depths in the slab. So we have measured these moisture gradients. And on the slabs that have vapor retarders, the bottom of the slab actually starts to dry. 
if you do not have a vapor retarder or if you have a blotter layer or cushion layer of aggregate between your slab and vapor retarder, the bottom of that slab continually gets rehydrated and effectively never dries. So very important. But there's a moisture gradient that develops, drier on top, wetter on bottom. All right? What happens when you put your flooring down? When that flooring is installed, that is six months, seven months later, when the flooring is installed, you effectively seal that system. You seal your slab, whether it's an epoxy or a VCT or whatever the floor covering may be. You basically seal that slab. No more moisture from the concrete is evaporating into the air. It's not evaporating at the same rate. So the moisture gradient that develops through the slab redistributes itself. Okay, it's no longer going to be a gradient dryer on top, wetter on bottom. It's going to actually pivot. It's going to redistribute itself. It may not any longer be 100%. If you have a vapor retarder, it'll be something less than 100%, but it'll basically re-equalize again. And that's kind of important because there's a couple of other uh, things that we can talk about, but keep in mind that, that redistribution of moisture. One of the things that we probably are all familiar with, and not necessarily strictly related to floor coverings, is curling or warping. Same moisture gradient has the effect of curling and warping. Slabs dry from the top down. The top part of the slab shrinks differentially from the bottom part of the slab, and the edges of the slab curl or warp upward. Hey, what happens when a floor covering contractor comes in to put a floor covering down on a curled or warped slab? can't put a floor covering on these curled or warped joints, so usually they reprofile the surface. Either they grind it or they put down a leveling compound. Somehow they reprofile it so it's flat. But look closely. They've reprofiled the surface, the top surface of the concrete slab, but they haven't done anything to the curled bottom surface of the concrete slab. What happens when you put your floor covering down? That same moisture redistribution occurs. It's no longer going to be drier on top than it is on the bottom. It's going to redistribute itself and equalize. And once there's not a moisture gradient anymore, that curling actually relaxes back downward. This was shown uh, back in the 60s at the Portland Cement Association. They basically said, if you have a curled slab that's drier on top, what happens if we flood it? Put water on it, flood it, rehydrate that surface, the curling actually relaxes back down take the water off, surface dries again, the concrete curls back up. But once you seal it with a floor covering, the concrete relaxes back down. And a lot of times you'll see these mole trails, we call them, these little buckles in the floor covering over those joints, cracks. Here's a <clears throat> BCT over a King and Fishes underlayment. Happened all of a sudden. This was a school in southern Illinois. And the principal said he went into the school one morning and just heard popping noise. So it's something that happens right away. Okay, poor polyurethane gymnasium floors. You can see the cracks here. What happened is there was no joints in this gymnasium floor. They just let it crack. Reprofiled, filled the cracks, put the poor polyurethane gymnasium floor down. It relaxed back down and extruded out the joint cell. You can see joints in a lot of these kind of facilities. This is an electrostatic dissipative floor. Good example here, a good picture of that extrusion of joint filler that comes out. Whatever that material is that you use to fill those joints can be extruded out during this warping relaxation. I, I mention this really just to say it's the same issue. It's the drying of concrete uh, related to floor coverings, causing and causing us problems with curling and warping, same thing. Concrete mix design, certainly a factor in the drying time of concrete slabs. The more water you have in your mix design, the more time that it's going to take for that excess water to leave the concrete. You probably all know TC Powers, uh, back with PCA, did some research on what is the water cement really required to hydrate all of the cement. Well, there's a little bit of a debate over this, but uh, because you're not sure if all of the water goes to hydrate all of the cement, but Let's just assume that we can have a system that's totally enclosed. How much water do we really need to hydrate the cement itself? It turns out the water cement ratio is about 0.26. Again, that's no bleeding, no evaporation, but it's a 0.26 water cement ratio. 
we know that we can't place a 0.26 water cement ratio. It doesn't have uh, any slump. It's not workable. It's not finishable. Most of our practical water cement ratios of concrete today are in the 0.45 to 0.55 ratio range. About twice as much as it takes to really hydrate the cement. And I say that because what happens to the other half? Half of the water we use is cement. The other half is what evaporates. So this is called water of convenience. Uh, a lot of this is actually released in the form of bleed water. When you're placing the slab, bleeding occurs, moisture bleeds to the surface, and evaporates off. But some of it certainly stays in your slab. On the setting time of slabs, there's you know, other factors that um, determine how much this water of convenience actually stays in your slab. But I think we can see that there is some additional water in concrete that needs to evaporate off. Lightweight concrete. <clears throat> lightweight concrete is lightweight because of the aggregate. The aggregate is very porous and lightweight. However, when you make a concrete mix design, you have to saturate that aggregate. You don't want the aggregate to remove any of the moisture from your paste. You don't want the aggregate to release any moisture into your paste. You have a design water cement ratio. So you have your aggregate saturated surface dry, it's called. Well, since lightweight aggregate is porous, it contains more water. Possibly this increases the drying time of lightweight concrete slabs. There have been studies that show the drying time is double. There have been other studies that show that it's not really that drastically greater, but I think we can see that there's more water. Depending on the density and permeability of the concrete paste, it could take longer for that water to release out of the concrete. All right. Every truckload of concrete delivers over 100 gallons of free water at no extra charge. It's absolutely free water. <laughs> so it's a lot of extra water that you've got to let get out of your concrete slab. All right, let's talk about surface finish. This is always a, an interesting one, especially for the concrete contractor. We're in a little bit of a quandary. The harder we finish the concrete slab, the denser we get the surface. And we know that. We can hard trowel a concrete slab. We can really densify the concrete slab. We can burnish the concrete slab, in fact. But the denser we get that finish, the, the more time it's going to take to release the extra water that's in the concrete. There's actually a study uh, that was done that shows concrete has so much extra water, if we just hard trowel it and burnish finish it, we don't even need to cure it. I totally disagree with that. You know, the hard trowel surface is dense and keep some moisture into the middle of the slab, but we cure it because of the exposed surface of the concrete. I, you know, I'm all for reducing the curing time. It certainly doesn't need to be 28 days. Uh, I usually say seven. Sometimes I even allow five. Five days of curing. But you've got to have some curing time for the extreme outer surface of the concrete, the top of the concrete slab, the part of the slab that you're going to be wearing. So you've got to cure it. But Basically what I'm saying is you're, you're hard traveling concrete slab, and just by doing that, you are increasing the drying time. Now, why do we hard trowel? The reason we do that is because there's usually a required flatness. And about 10 years ago, I tried with several contractors to just float the slabs. But depending on your floor covering, you just can't get the flatness that you need. You can't get the surface texture required not to broadcast through the floor covering itself. So it's a discussion item. Most of the time, as you know, the concrete contractor doesn't know what kind of flooring is going to go in. All he sees is Division Three of the specs, and he sees a flatness. And we can achieve that flatness, no problem. But we have to use trowel. If you have a discussion at the pre-bid meeting or pre-construction meeting, what kind of floor covering is going to go in there? Perhaps we can do a lighter trowel. Don't have to necessarily do a very hard trowel, maybe we can reduce that flatness to give us some comfort. Okay, burnishing I talked about, we're trying to reduce the amount of burnishing that's happening just in general. Uh, we've looked at a lot of slab sweating issues, and the harder troweled you get the surface of that slab, the more glass-like you get it, the more likely you have a potential slab sweating issue. So we've tried to come up with ways of, of trying to prevent burnishing. 
very difficult. How do you specify? I want a very hard trowel. Stop troweling just before you burnish it. You know, that's very, very difficult to, to specify and very, very difficult to do. One way that we do know that you can't burnish a slab if you use a plastic waste. So sometimes for that last trowel pass or the troweling in general, using these plastic blades will prevent you from really installing a burnished finish. Now, we all know that they wear, they cost money. That is something that needs to be discussed at the pre-bid, pre-construction meeting. All right, so that's surface finish. Here's a, a, a great picture of a, a sweating slab that we had. And you can see the difference here between the ride-on, hard trowel, burnished area out in the center of the slab and the pour back strip along the perimeter of the slab. The pour back strip was finished by hand, wasn't finished nearly as dense, and you can see the pour back strip in this particular case is completely dry. Now it was, it was troweled, it felt hard, it was wear resistant, I couldn't scratch it, um, but you can see the difference between what I would consider the burnished finish out in the majority of the slab and that lighter tight trowel finish around the pour back strip and around the perimeter. Curing, one of the other factors in, in concrete drying time. Depends on the method of curing, really. First of all, I continue, and I'm sure you do too, I continue to hear curing and drying, those two terms, used interchangeably. When there's a floor covering problem, it seems like just about every time somebody says, well, that slab didn't cure long enough. Look how wet it is. And I say, well, it's still curing. It's you know, curing is keeping the slab wet, extending the hydration of the, the cement. Drying is the exact opposite, letting it dry. I know it's probably everybody on the on the call today probably is well familiar with that, but I continue to hear it didn't cure long enough, which is just ridiculous. But we always recommend moisture retaining covers, especially when a floor covering, moisture sensitive floor covering is going to be installed. Why is that? And I'm not saying wet cure necessarily. There are some great absorbent covers that are available on the market that you roll out. You may apply some water as they're rolling. And really, there's no extra water, no soaker hoses. Um, very rarely do you have to add more water to that system, but it will keep the slab wet. It retains that half of the water that you put in the concrete mix. It just retains that water to cure the slab. The reason I like these is because when you take up that moisture retaining cure cover, it starts to dry. It's drying right now. You take it up, immediately it starts to dry. Curing compounds, which, you know, uh, I'm not a, I don't dislike curing compounds. I, they're, they're fine. But what are they intended to do? Curing compound is intended to be sprayed and applied to the slab surface, form a film, and prevent drying, basically, prevent evaporation from the concrete slab surface. All well and good, but they will continue to prevent drying and slow down the drying time of your concrete slab until they are removed. And one of the things I like to hear on the market is dissipating. Well, we use a dissipating curing compound, which got to start drying. Well, when does that start drying? They're dissipating because they break down under ultraviolet light exposure. They're not disappearing. They still remain on the surface, and if you don't expose them to ultraviolet light, they can be really difficult to remove from the concrete slab surface. So the point is, if you have a curing compound, at some point, and very early on in the process, it's best to remove, mechanically remove that curing compound. One, to let the slab dry, and two, that I'm aware of, there are no adhesive manufacturers that will provide their warranty for their floor covering system if there's a curing compound that hasn't been removed. And as you know, if you look at the cost of curing compounds versus moisture retaining covers, if you include removal of that curing compound, it can be a costly item. So that's, that's curing. curing. Again, curing compounds, all well and good, but they extend the drying time. Ambient conditions. You know, I was just in Charleston, South Carolina not long ago, swam in the hotel pool, took my towel and put it over the railing. Next day, I went to go for another swim, and that towel that had been there all night and half the day was still wet. It's very humid. Charleston's beautiful, but it's very 
very humid in Charleston, South Carolina, that towel did not dry. It was still damp. Same thing happens with concrete slabs. If you don't expose the concrete slab to drying conditions, it won't dry. It'll stay moist. If you're in Houston, Texas, or Charleston, South Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, these are humid areas. So most of the time, if not all the time, the concrete contractor is not in control of those ambient conditions. All right? Um, slab exposure. When was the roof installed? When was the window put in place? I went on a job last year, and the slab was still wet. General contractor was very upset. This slab was placed eight months ago. I can't believe it's still wet. And I said, well, when was the roof, you know, when was the building watertight? Three weeks ago. So it's got to be watertight in order for it to dry. There's plenty of studies out there that show if the slab is exposed to rain or rehydrates, it completely rehydrates. The drying time starts back to zero. Okay, no matter how old it is, two months, three months, rain on the slab, starting it all over again. So it's very important as far as drying time in the concrete slab to get that building watertight as soon as possible. Okay, HVAC. I usually do not have success talking about getting the HVAC operational. If you can do that and suggest that if the owner is open to the idea, usually he's not because he has a brand new HVAC system and, you know, obviously with construction dust, he's afraid of damaging that equipment. So it's usually pretty difficult to get the HVAC running, but it certainly is a discussion item. The sooner you can get that, that interior, that slab building climatized, that's going to provide those drying conditions. All right, I want to talk just a minute about the latest test methods, and I hope that we're all familiar with them. I'm going to go through them kind of quickly as far as what they are, but I'd like to just talk about some of the newest um, details about some of these tests. There's four ASTMs that I'm going to talk about, and this latest ASTM here that uh, was recently introduced is the electrical impedance, ASTM F2659. These are handheld meters. You put them down on the surface of a concrete slab, and they give you a reading in some kind of a scale. Sometimes the scale is 1 to 100, sometimes it's 1 to 1,000. Uh, depending on what that scale is, you get a reading. These do detect higher and lower amounts of moisture. A moist slab will have a higher reading compared to that same concrete with less moisture. However, the thing to be very aware of with these pieces of equipment is other things also affect the electrical resistance and electrical impedance of these meters. Type of aggregate, um, amount of curing that's happened, uh, type of finish, uh, sealers or curing compounds, the presence of those. All of these things can have an effect on what those meters read. So just to be aware of them, they're very quick and easy to, to, to do, but they certainly aren't reliable by themselves in determining if the slab is dry enough. Okay, the hood test. This is the Surface RH test, ASTM F2420. Uh, if, if anyone out there is familiar with it, it's probably it's a British standard. Uh, basically what it is is a hood, an insulated hood, and you put a relative humidity inside the hood. You don't drill it into the slab. You put the, the hood on the top of the slab, and you're looking for the relative humidity under this sealed hood uh, to increase. And... Uh, the reason you probably haven't heard of it, if you haven't, is because it's not, um, uh, there, there are no floor coverings in the United States that require this test in order to secure a warrant. And the reason for that is that the test as it's written right now, ASTM F2420, requires the reading of that relative humidity sensor to be at 72 hours. The relative humidity underneath that hood probably won't change drastically only in the first 72 hours it continues to change dynamically for the first two, three, four weeks. So right now, the standard is written to be a short-term test, to be kind of competitive with the other tests in the same uh, time frame. I think this test has promise, but I think that we have to revisit it. Uh, all among committee ASTM F6, and I think we are revisiting it. Unfortunately, I think it may have been reapproved, um, but uh, I think it needs to be revisited become a longer-term test. 
indicated. The two tests that we're probably most familiar with, testing chloride, ASTM F1869. The United States is the only country in the world that uses this test. Um, we developed it uh, back in the 1940s. So we have a lot of history with the test. Basically what you do with this test is you're taking a dish of calcium chloride, putting it on the surface of a concrete slab and putting a dome over it and measuring the, the uptake of moisture into that calcium chloride dish. You weigh the dish dry and you weigh the dish wet and you can put it through the equation to give you a moisture vapor emission rate, MVER. The problem with this test is that, again, we have a moisture gradient through the concrete slab. It's drier on the top than it is on the bottom. So you're putting this test on the surface of the concrete slab and measuring whatever moisture may be available in the surface of the concrete slab, only in the surface. Uh, the test is only 60 to 72 hours, so in that short amount of time, you don't get moisture migrating from the bottom of the slab up and, and becoming part of your measurement. It's really only that it's in the surface of the slab only. Now, that measurement in itself is important because when you go to put on your adhesive, when the, when the flooring installer applies the adhesive, he really needs to know if the surface of that slab is dry to an acceptable limit. These newer uh, adhesives are water-based, and you need to know if the top of that slab is dry enough. So. It does have an importance. It will show you the short-term um, ability to install your floor covering correctly and allow that adhesive to tack out properly. But as far as long-term prediction of potential problems, you're potentially missing a, a large source of moisture down deeper in the concrete slab. So again, that test does moisture vapor emission rate from the top. doesn't really talk about how much moisture you have within the slab. Okay, we'll talk about internal relative humidity. This is ASTM F2170. This is the test that you drill into the concrete slab to a depth of 40% of its slab thickness, install a relative humidity sensor, and measure the relative humidity down in the slab. This kind of lets you know what your reservoir of moisture is. How much moisture do you have potentially deep in that concrete slab to migrate up and cause problems with floor covering? Okay, let's talk just a minute, 40% depth. Where did that number come from? Why is this mid-depth? Where is 40% from? You remember this chart here that I, I showed that shows the moisture gradient before you put the floor covering down? Then after the moisture gradient, it pivots. It pivots at a point, and it actually pivots at 40% slab depth. So the only static number on that moisture gradient before you put the floor covering down is at a depth of 40%. This is based on research that was conducted in Sweden. Uh, Sweden has used this type of testing much longer than the United States has, um, and that's where that number of 40% depth comes from. All right, so that's, the, again, the only static number on that moisture gradient. You may have heard in recent years, over the past two, three years, there has been some rumbling in the industry. The number that you get is dependent on the brand of equipment that you use. Well, as we know, regardless of your ASTM standard, it shouldn't depend on what brand of equipment you use as long as all that equipment is compliant with the ASTM standard. You should get the same number. We weren't getting that. In fact, there was a discrepancy of 10, 12, 13% difference. So some relative humidity sensors will measure high, 98, 99% while others are measuring in the mid-80s. Why is that? It should not be that way. I think the entire industry agreed that it shouldn't be that way. I have known general contractors not allow certain brands of relative humidity sensors in favor of another brand where they know they get lower numbers. ASTM Committee F6 actually conducted a short study on this. And what we found was the sensors themselves, they basically all come from the same place in Switzerland, they're all basically the same. If you remove the sensor from everybody's equipment and you put them into a chamber, they pretty much read within the tolerance, you know, about 2%, so probably within about 2% accuracy. It's not the sensors that's different, it's the housing. And if you look at the housing at these different manufacturers, you can see there's some here, the, uh, the yellow and green one on the left-hand side has an excellent gasket system, but that gasket system is up at the top. Now remember,
remember, go back to the same curve here, you have a moisture gradient. You want to measure the relative humidity at a depth of 40%, not the average relative humidity of the slab above 40%. You just want to measure it at 40 So you want to isolate the measurement down to that depth. And if you take a look again at some of these sensors, you can see the one on the right-hand side, it's what it's called a basket sleeve, right? It's completely open on the sides. It doesn't isolate the measurement to the bottom. And the further you isolate to the bottom of that hole that's drilled 40% into your slab, the higher that moisture measurement's going to be. So unfortunately, the equipment that measured high was probably the equipment that was measuring accurately, believe it or not. You're measuring the depth at 40% and not the average relative humidity of the top half of the slab. All right, so I'm happy to say that all the manufacturers of the equipment participated in our ASTM study. They were all very interested in why the discrepancy. Uh, they're all redeveloping their equipment. Uh, the latest ASTM F2170 has been modified. And those of you that have sat on consensus committees, you know how hard it is to get a new document written and approved. This document was new in 2009, it was new in 2010, and it is finally new again in 2011. It underwent three approved, voted on changes in three years. Remarkable, and that just goes to show you kind of the learning curve that we in the U.S. have had with this test. But now in the latest ASTM test method, it talks about the sleeve system. It talks about the, the, the equipment needed to measure and, and limit it so that you do get an isolated reading, isolated to a depth of 40%. Uh, another factor that we also found was it depends on the amount of air, the air pocket that's isolated at that depth. If you're measuring the relative humidity in a larger air pocket, you get a different reading than if you were using the same sensor and measuring it in a smaller air pocket. So the new ASTM standard talks about that volume of air as well. So just uh, you know, look for it. Doesn't matter what manufacturer, um, they should all now uh, measure uh, the same. And I think these are the only four that are out now, and the others are still uh, still rolling out their new products. Very very new. All right. So we've kind of gone through here options to discuss at the pre-bid and pre-construction meetings. Certainly, you want to talk about vapor retarder type and location. You want to make sure that if there's a moisture sensitive the floor covering and they're looking for drying time, you've got to have that thing right under the concrete slab. And I know as concrete contractors, we cringe at that. But there are ways to look at your concrete mix design and control the bleeding and things like that. Um, the way you're finishing, uh, alter that rather than look at long-term moisture problems. Second slab exposure, building enclosure, HVAC use, very important. Those ambient conditions really determine the drying rate of a concrete slab. Desired and actually required slab finish. What's really necessary? Do we need to have an FF80? Do, can we get away with an FF30? You know, you've got to relieve the concrete contractor of trying to achieve these high numbers if you're looking at increasing or decreasing your drying time, increasing the rate of drying. All right, test methods. Probably want to discuss what test methods are going to be used. Um, at least mention it. You know, mention has got to be the latest equipment, the latest uh, test methods out there to measure the moisture. Slab curling potential and risk of warping relaxation. Absolutely. Um, you know, if it's a jointed concrete slab, that slab is intended to curl to some degree. If the slab has joints, the joints are there to tell the slab where to crack. And curling will occur at all discontinuations in the slab, all cracks, all joints. The magnitude of that curling is heavily dependent on the shrinkage potential of the concrete mixture. But if it's a jointed slab, it is intended to crack somewhat. Warping relaxation, I'm always asked, how do we know? How can we predict that? Uh, if you're involved in a, in a project where there's a tremendous amount of grinding or re-leveling, reprofiling, there is a large risk of warping relaxation. If the slab only curls an eighth of an inch, 
probably very little risk. Quarter of an inch, maybe a little bit more risk, certainly a half an inch or above. And I've seen inch and a half curling in a 12 foot by 12 foot flat panel. Certainly if you're in this range and a tremendous amount of grinding is required, I just went last week on a job with a concrete contractor is trying to get paid for doing about $80,000 worth of grinding. We're going to get him paid. But the big question was, how much grinding did you do? And now are you concerned about warping relaxation? So uh, definitely a discussion item to be had. Paper proofing admixtures. There are some admixtures on the market that uh, claim that if they're used in the concrete mixture, they will vapor proof the concrete. I have not seen uh, data and I have not been able to test these systems um, to be convincing for myself to be able to stand behind them and recommend them myself. Um, if they use thus far, we have tried to understand the chemistry involved and, and how they do what they claim to do and we cannot seem to understand the chemistry. There doesn't seem to be enough product to do what they claim to do. Remember, we're talking about vapor. We're not talking about liquid water. Water tightness and vapor tightness are two completely different things. So uh, what I usually say, and I'm not trying to um, say anything negative, uh, I'm not sure that they're reliable on their own as vapor proofing systems. Uh, they may be part of the overall system, but I would look at them and evaluate them heavily. A lot of owners are now, and, and specifiers are requiring them in the specs. A lot of concrete contractors are bidding on them. I'm getting a lot of calls uh, if, if I know this product and what it does as far as finishing. And, you know, does it do anything um, you know, hurtful in any other way? And then, by the way, does it do what it says it's going to do? So I, I don't know. Just be, uh, I guess be, uh, be aware that they're there. Uh, the last one here on the list is quick drying concrete. That has been on the market now a couple of years, and there are some systems out there that actually are wrap drying concrete. Um, you know, they, they differ from conventional concrete in that they actually dry internally. They're self-defecating concrete mixtures, and they're proprietary systems, but you can see on this table, standard or conventional concrete, it's transportable, pumpable, placeable, finishable, set properly. The newer rapid drying concrete systems that are on the market do all of this, but they also add reduced moisture vapor emission rate, reduced relative humidity, and then the last one, of course, owner satisfaction. The owner is satisfied if he can get into his building as quick as he can. I, I've worked for some owners that one in their building 60 days after groundbreaking, you know, an incredible fast track pace. Uh, to get in there. So these rapid drying concrete mixtures are a potential solution. And of course there's a cost associated with them, but what is that cost relative to being able to get into the building sooner and not have a floor covering problem? So it's certainly something that can be offered in pre-bid and pre-construction meetings. <clears throat> Again, the conventional concrete shown on the top dries from the top, okay, and that causes your your, your drying time, it causes your moisture gradient, it causes your curling and warping. These newer concrete mixtures dry from the top because they certainly are still exposed at the top, but they're also drying from within. The materials in the concrete itself continue to hydrate and consume that extra water, that water of convenience, continues to be consumed from within. Okay, so it says, you know, if slides are cast with rapid drying concrete, what about the curling and warping potential? We have seen these, we've been able to measure a few of these different concrete systems, and since they don't develop a moisture gradient, they don't develop significant curling and warping. Either. They're not there. We've tried to uh, have some slabs cast without any joints, okay, because um, there's probably not a lot of shrinkage that's involved in some of these systems. So right now people are certainly still skeptical not putting any joints in a slab, uh, but, uh, you know, they, they certainly don't curl and warp the same as a conventional concrete slab would. Okay, can it be pumped? Can it be screeded? Can it be my, my initial reaction when it first came out, uh, these systems, you can't finish it. You know, we've seen this before, very low water cement ratio, below 0.4. Um, you know, it, it's not able to be placed and finished properly. But 
you know, I've been invited out to uh, to job sites where it's being used, and I'm happy to say, you know, I'm not a finisher myself, but I was able to to get a float and a trowel and actually work it a little bit myself, and you're you're able to bring up plenty of cream to the surface. It, it really does act just like conventional concrete. You can see some of the some of the pictures here. Um, <clears throat> some of the systems uh, have teamed up with polyolefin vapor retarders to isolate that slab. The concrete itself can dry, but if you're not cutting off the moisture from below, you can have problems from below. Okay, so there are those. How long? There are systems on the market that say guaranteed 30 days. Okay, so it will dry to an acceptable limit 30 days following watertight enclosure to build. All right, so again, remediation, let's talk a, a little bit about what happens if slabs don't dry quick enough and they don't meet the expected drying time. There are things that, that can be done. Again, none of these things should involve the concrete contractor. Allow more time or accelerate the drying. Alternate finishes, topical moisture barriers, replacement. Take a look at these. You can allow more time if you'd like. Again, those factors are how the slab is finished, how the slab is cured, when was the slab enclosed, and what is the ambient relative humidity. It can take a tremendous amount of time to dry naturally. And I'm talking 9, 10, 11 months. It can take a long time. And a lot of construction schedules just don't have this amount of time. Okay, we can certainly accelerate it. First time I saw these fans, you know, I thought he was being one of the good old boys, and he said, I just saw them big-ass fans. And I said, yeah, those are big effing fans. And I didn't know, you know, until later on when I looked closely at my photographs, you know, we're all familiar now with this brand. But there's other brands out there, but these giant fans move a tremendous amount of air. Now, if that air is dry, you're actually going to increase the, the, the drying of the concrete slab. If you're moving a tremendous amount of humid air across the slab, you're not necessarily going to speed up the drying process. But one of the things these big fans do, they push the hotter air from the ceiling of these facilities down to the, to the floor of the facility. So they actually increase the slab temperature, and that can accelerate the drying. Uh, there's other systems out there that blow specifically heated dehumidified air through the system, through the building to dry it. Electroosmosis is a system that can be installed. It's an electrical system, you know, empowered. The moisture is driven from the anodes to the cathodes in the system. Okay, we have done a little bit of work on looking at this water layer. Remember, there was 20, over 20 years where this was the industry standard slab detail. There's a lot of hospitals, a lot of schools out there that have this detail. Uh, when I was at CTL, we were, we were able to look at a hospital and we were able to pour down through the slab and blow air into that aggregate layer and then vent it in another area of the, of the slab and put that vented air through a HEPA filter and, you know, recirculate that air. We were able to give the moisture an easier path, and we found that that actually worked, but we also found that that may never be able to be turned off. Even after five years, there was still plenty of moisture in that system. Okay, alternative finishes. You've probably seen them if you go into the bait box uh, Storage. They're, they're, they're doing, you know, uncovered slabs as their store floor, stained concrete, beautiful floors, uh, diamond grinding. Ten years ago, I mentioned diamond grinding on the job and basically was laughed out of the trailer. There was no way we were going to do any kind of diamond grinding. Nowadays, grinding is much more common. Um, it's, it's not necessarily cost prohibitive. Tasty mint is terrazzo less affected by moisture, thin overlay stains, breathable coatings. Okay, you can actually pattern stamp a slab, put a breathable coating down. Uh, you can also do ceramic or quarry tile because it has a cementitious mastic. It's less moisture sensitive. So um, these are potential options for moisture sensitivity. Topical moisture barriers. They have a category of reactive penetrants. I love these products. They're silicates. I like them for hardening and densifying. I don't necessarily like them for sealing a concrete slab. Like the other products that I, I was mentioning before, I haven't seen the data 
I haven't seen the testing that shows that a silicate, a reactive penetrant, can densify the surface enough to stop vapor movement. Okay, it, it just, it's so dependent on the amount of calcium hydroxide in the slab. I'm not sure that these are entirely reliable. Um, I know they've worked, um, but I guess I would, I, I would be skeptical uh, when they're proposed. Uh, liquid applied topical vapor retarders, there's more than 75 on the market, a tremendous amount of them. Uh, they must be effective at stopping moisture and high pH. They must be compatible with flooring. I talked about some of the risks. Warping relaxation, a risk with any floor covering, sealing the surface. Um, another one is ASR. You probably all know alkali silica reactivity. It's the alkali from cement reacting with the reactive silicate aggregates. Uh, not all siliceous aggregates are reactive, but if you have a reactive siliceous aggregate, you can actually get an expansion. And what happens is if that aggregate is in the surface of a concrete slab, it could dry out really quickly. This reaction requires 80% relative humidity. So if the surface of the slab dries to below 80%, you may have reactive aggregate just sitting there waiting to be rehydrated and, and have the reaction. So what rehydrates it is when you put down a floor covering, potentially. Okay, again, moisture diffusion goes up through after you put your floor covering down you can drive up that pH, okay? bring with it a soluble salt, create a scenario where ASR occurs. Here's a, a picture of, of ASR reactive aggregates and the resulting dimples or blisters that occur from these right. They look like osmotic blisters in a, in a coating system or a flooring system. Okay, replacement procedures. Very, very rarely do I recommend any kind of replacement procedure. I have seen it done, unfortunately. Um, building reuse, um, I was on a job just a couple of years ago that had a slab sweating issue, and we proposed several remedies, and they chose to remove and replace about 300,000 square feet of the slab. So uh, you may have heard of it down in Florida. Um, really disappointing, really, uh, that the option. The option worked. Um, the, the user is using the slab and very happy with the drying. Uh, but it did not have a vapor retarder, and they chose as the remedy was to replace. All right, another potential option is putting a, an overlay, an unbonded overlay over an existing slab that's not drying. You put a vapor retarder down, put your overlay down, and have it dry much quicker. All right, to wrap up, I really didn't talk too much about geotechnical design, but we're developing wetter and wetter lands. Um, certainly that liquid moisture I, I talked about didn't matter where that water table was, but if the water table is near zero below the slab, that liquid water certainly is, is an issue that needs to be contended with. We need to make sure we have well-drained subgrade. A high-performance vapor retarder, practical low water cement ratio. It does not have to be 0 0.4. Uh, practical low water cement ratio is, I think, 0.45 to 0.55. All right, ample drying time, climatization, Testing by an independent testing lab, um, mitigation of compliance if necessary. If we could just include a separate bid item in our bid documents to include mitigation, I think it would take care of a lot of lawsuits in the, in the, in the country. Right now the lawsuits are because nobody has that mitigation or that remedy in their budget. And it becomes finger pointing and somebody's got to come up with the money. And then the owner doesn't want to. Um, certainly the contractors don't want to, the flooring installer doesn't want to. If it's in the bid document, it's in the project specification, a separate bid item, mitigation, remediation, and what that might be, topical treatments or, you know, everybody would bid on that, and it would be included in somebody's budget. So I think that, that may be, you know, a solution out there. Learn from previous experience, and certainly always remember Slabs take a lot longer to dry than you might expect. Most people think they can get in there in a month or two. And some people are ready to test it at any time, and some people don't test it at all and really roll the dice. Okay, and the last thing I wanted to wrap up with, not all floors are intended to be floating floor systems. So just keep that in mind. And I would like very much uh, to open it up to questions. Um, I think I took the full hour. I'm sorry, but... Uh, um, my, you have my email and my information. 
um, and I certainly can uh, can answer questions that way unless you'd like to open them up uh, for questions now. Thank you, and I'll begin the question and answer session. If you have a question, please press zero, then one on your touchtone phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, please press zero, then two. If you're using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset before pressing the numbers. Once again, if there are any questions, please press zero, then one on your touchtone phone. Standing by for questions. And I'm showing no questions at this time. Very good. Please uh, email me if you have any questions. I appreciate everybody's attendance today, and I hope that uh, hope I said something that maybe you hadn't heard before. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.